it's going to be a fantastic week. We have a very packed schedule, as always. Um, there is no time to sleep. And, and as, uh, uh, our former PAO office at NASA always says, uh, science never sleeps. And so we plan on putting it to the test here in Bellevue. So we have lots of really great things going on, exciting speakers, great sections. But I want to bring a couple things to your attention. One thing is the meeting's green. And so very nicely, there are no plastic holders. Just paper, yay. In addition to that, we don't have programs, but we do have the mobile app. It's called AGU Events, and you can either download it through the link from the program, or it's also in the Apple Store or Google Play um, apps. Uh, available for download. So make sure you download that. S sign yourself up for notifications. Make your schedule. Don't miss a thing. Uh, if you have any problems with downloading or, or operating it, there's a help desk right next to registration. So check that out. Also, something that's new this year, and for those of you that have been at AGU you may remember that as part of the poster um, session, there were also these things called e-light night which I think is what this is. It's a multimedia opportunity for you to interact with um, scientists and their research. And so you can, of course, look for that schedule on your app. It's there. Please mark some and drop by and see one. Before we move on to what's happening here tonight, uh, I wanted to take an opportunity to thank a few people. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Vicki Meadows, who is the chair of the Science Organizing Committee, and our host here in Seattle. So Vicki and her committee have done an amazing job, put together a great schedule, and worked very hard to, to showcase uh, all the research that we do in astrobiology. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. We have the Earth and Life Science Institute and, and the uh, Tokyo Tech uh, University. We have the SETI Institute and Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. So a round of applause for them as well. And that's about it for me. Have a fantastic week. Um, take advantage of everything we have to offer. And anyone who's interested in hosting this next year in your city, come and talk to me. So thanks. Hi there, I'm Melissa Kirvin Brooks from the NASA Astrobiology Institute and the NASA Astrobiology Program. So I just wanted to you know, share some thoughts today before I introduce Anthony. So at the beginning of any conference um, that I've attended, I'm always in anticipation of what I'm gonna learn and what breakthroughs are gonna be shared. So I wanna hear more about methane. Um, this year's AvSciCon theme is Understanding and Enabling the Search for Life on Worlds Near and Far. Um, from the time I was a child, I was always fascinated by imagining the future and what humans could be like in the future, in future worlds. So I grew up with the original Star Trek, and I enjoyed Voyager, and The Next Generation, and Deep Space Nine, and even Enterprise. <laughs> Um, then came Star Trek Discovery, and we had an actual astrobiologist or an, an, uh, an astromycologist. Um, they use a spore drive, and they feature a giant tardigrade, who's my favorite creature. So I love Michael Burnham's character, but I particularly was excited about Lieutenant Commander Paul Stamets the astromycologist, who is actually based on a true mycologist, Paul Stamets, who wrote a book in 2005 called Mycelium Running, How Mushrooms Can Save the World. Um, so this astrobiologist, Lieutenant Commander Paul Stamets, um, has a, has a, on the, on, as a member of the crew, his husband, Dr. Hugh Culber, who's the medical officer. So they're the first same-sex couple in the future that I know about. And it wasn't a big deal. It was very matter-of-fact in the show. So this is how I imagine the future. So some background on our guest, Anthony Rapp. Um, so you may know him from his various roles throughout his prolific acting career and singing career. He's best known for originating the role of Mark Cohen in Jonathan Larson's Tony Award winning rock opera, Rent, for which he shared an Obie Award um, with the rest of the cast. And his films include Adventures in Babysitting, Dazed and Confused, A Beautiful Mind, and Rent. 
Um, he is a writer as well, and Anthony penned a New York Times bestseller, Without You, a memoir of love, loss, and the musical Rent. He can currently be seen as Lieutenant Commander Paul Stamets on Star Trek Discovery on CBS All Access. So please join me in welcoming Anthony Rapp. Thank you. Um, I know that you all at uh, academic and scientific conferences are probably used to like standing behind podiums and having like laser pointers, but I'm, I'm used to like, uh, I come from theaters, so I'm used to being able to roam freely. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand here probably more often than not, if that's okay with you. Uh, thank you very much, Melissa, for having me be a part of this. I am truly in awe of the work that all of you from around the world are doing in this wonderful field uh, of astrobiology, which I, you know, the, the, it really means, to me, it's like the study of star life, you know, astro star, biology life, uh, you know, so that it's close to Star Trek, right? Um, uh, I'm, I'm here because of, because of star, being a part of Star Trek Discovery, which is a strange, and if I look back on my life, the, the, the path that I've taken is one that uh, I, w I, I wouldn't have predicted that I would be in that show in particular, but um, I grew up as a major nerd, in, I grew up out in a suburb of Chicago called Joliet, Illinois, reading comic books, watching the original Star Trek movies in the movie theaters, uh, watching the original Star Wars movies, in the movie theaters um, when I was like six, seven, eight years old. So I've always been captivated by that, but I always thought that I would be uh, an audience member, a bystander to uh, peering into these worlds and being struck with wonder by them, but I never imagined myself being in them because I was really a creature of the theater. I was in musical theater from the, the age of six. So if a couple of years ago, um, I literally, and I was getting ready for bed, and my, I checked my email one more time before going to sleep, and I had this email from my, um, my representative, my manager, saying, are you interested in being a part of the new Star Trek sh series? And I was like, uh-huh, yeah, of course. I had no idea what role it would be, it didn't even matter. Whatever it was, I would have, I would have, I would have been the guy walking down the corridor with like an antenna sticking out of my head. Um, so it, was, it literally just dropped into, and, 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 it wasn't, and it wasn't an audition, it was just an offer, which doesn't happen very often in my field, believe me. There are plenty of things that I've had to audition for plenty of times and never got. Plenty of things that I've auditioned for and did get, and only a small handful of things that were just offered in this way. So it was, it was such a, a gift that, that fell, out of, fell out of the sky into my lap. Uh, and it has already opened up so many incredible doors and opportunities, including being here. One of the, this, the reason I, that I am here more directly is that uh, uh, I was invited to go to NASA, um, the Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California, because thanks, thank you, social media. Um, I was, uh, I received a message on Facebook, of all places, uh, from a, an employee there who was putting together a speaking uh, event around the Pride, Pride Month or slash LGBT uh, Employees Association, and he thought it would be cool or if I would be interested in, in being a part of that. And I immediately jumped to that chance. And while I was there, I met Melissa. I got to sit in and speak with her and her colleagues about the incredible work they're doing in the Astrobiology, Astrobiology Institute. And then we just kept in touch and said, would you be interested in coming to this conference? So yeah, so uh, this whole thing has been a matter of incredible circumstance and luck and uh, I would say a little bit of perseverance. But it, it struck me that it's not exactly the same thing as what you all are doing with this mysterious and wonderful pursuit of discovery discovering life in the deepest, weirdest parts of our planet as well as exoplanets and many other planets out there in the, in the universe. But it seems to me that it is a mixture of all those things. You certainly don't always know where the opportunity will come, where you'll make this discovery, but you keep just putting your, your nose to the grindstone, sticking your heads in your computers, working with each other across disciplines, and hopefully you will, you will find these, these breakthroughs. Maybe this methane will mean something. 
And I know that I'm an actor, I'm playing a scientist, I have incredible regard for science, I'm learning more about science from playing the scientist, and I know that you all, as far as I know, maybe some of you are moonlighting actors, but most of you are scientists, right? So it seems like there might be something of a gulf between the work that I do and the work that you do. But as I've been thinking about uh, coming here, I think that there are some really strong parallels. Uh, and I was especially struck by that earlier today when I was uh, part uh, in sitting in on a, a, the uh, media um, presentation to the media about some of the work that's been going on. One of the things that is very similar to me is that if you sit down in front of your computer and you put up Netflix or CBS All Access or Amazon Prime or you sit in front of your TV, you see the finished product. And yes, you could look at the credits at the end and you could see, oh, there's all those people who do those weird, mysterious things from all those different departments. But basically, you're just looking at the shiny pictures and the people who are in front of the camera and, and, and the story that's been told and all the work that went into telling it happened over there and you don't necessarily know anything about that, but you're just present to the, the finished product. Similarly, if I'm sitting and I'm like doing a little Google search about like what's happening with pursuit of discovery of life on Mars, what I see is the pictures from the rovers, and uh, you know I maybe we'll find a, a, a the headline today that I saw in the New York Times about the methane on Mars. But of clearly, from today's presentation, there are so many different departments that are so invisible to us in the public sphere that require so much, in so many months, years of preparation, so much inter interdisciplinary collaboration between all the different departments. And I dare say that it's very much the same thing when you sit down and watch Star Trek Discovery. There are these guys called grips that move the equipment around and that they have to know the inside, the inner workings of the, of the lights and the cameras that uh, I don't, I certainly wouldn't know how to do that. I, I mean, I could, I guess I could push something, but you know, they, they, there's a certain level, higher level of skill than that. There are the, the months of the writers getting together in the room to what they call break a story where they, discuss the ideas of the plot that they want to tell, that they think about the creatures they might want to create for the, this iteration of Star Trek. And believe me, astrobiologists, we are aware that in the universe, it's unlikely we're going to find quite so many humanoid-like creatures. We understand this, but you have to understand that it's really a matter of our biology as humans playing these roles. I mean, I'm not playing, I'm playing a human, but you know, there's only so much you can do with to people who have two eyes and nose and mouth and ears. And so most of the most of the creatures and aliens that we have get created have to have something like that or else you'd have actors walking into walls. You know, there was at one point a tardigrade, a giant tardigrade that was meant to be a, a member of our crew. Um, but it, truly, but uh, it turned out, you know, that just the budgetary concerns and the, you know, all that stuff makes it a little impossible. Maybe that'll happen in the future as these as costs go down or whatever. So, we understand that that it's very likely that that the the life that we would encounter if we were in Starfleet generally would probably be weird microbes or squid-like things or gaseous forms or who knows what. So we we, we get it. We get it. But you know, for now, you're going to have to deal with the pig face men and the you know, the the Andorians with the with the antennas and, and et cetera, et cetera. But I digress. But anyway, so we have these months of the of the writers breaking the story. I don't even know all the stuff that they're doing. I just get I get sent a script. I read the script. I get to learn you know download that information in my mind, and then I show up on the set. I'm surrounded by a hundred or more people who are members of the crew who do all the work. We, we break down the script into s tiny parts. You, you work on one scene a day, two, maybe two or three scenes a day. And then you never do it again. You move on to the next scene, and, and et cetera, et cetera. But then all of that gets shuffled into the digital information, put into the editor's hands, and then he or she edits it together into a form, and then it's sent to the visual effects department, and they put in all their wizardry, and then you see the final product. So I do believe that there's a great similarity, and it's also true that uh, I don't necessarily ever meet many of those people, especially in the post-production, what is called the post-production side of things, and yet I could not do my job or my job wouldn't mean as much or wouldn't be given the opportunity to mean as much if it weren't for all those people who I probably may never meet who are doing the incredible hours of work and with artistry and skill. I would imagine it's similar in your field that there's people who are looking at the striations of weird rocks who are doing that kind of work who might not ever know the people who are building the drill 
on the rover that drills into the surface of Mars. And yet, you, you know, the, the one work absolutely informs or helps the other. So I think that that's, that is similar and it's also inspiring to me. It's, a, it's another level of awe that I have for the, the layers of discipline, the layers of artistry, the layers of thought, care, creativity that is required in your field that I do, you know, I can start to lean into and grasp my head uh, uh, around because when I start hearing like, certain terms I frankly you know I don't know I don't know what all these things mean I don't have the training you do but I do love to look at the pretty pictures of the Mars rover doing the things that it, doing the things that it's doing and I love getting to talk to Melissa and hearing even glimpses of the incredible research and work that you are all engaged in uh, I, I don't know if the people in this room would share this uh, feeling, but it's been shared with me many times over in the last couple of years since I was lucky enough to become a part of the Star Trek world, that Star Trek has been such an important part of the scientific community, an important source of inspiration, an important uh, mirror holding up a possible future, a vision of a possible future, and inspiring in some ways direct iterations into our technology. So I'm, I'd be curious to see how many people in this room for whom that might be the case, that some version of one of the many, myriad Star Trek stories ha had any part in helping encourage you to become the scientists that you are today. I can tell you that meeting you and getting to engage with you has deeply inspired me in the work that I'm doing. And when I, you know, very got to nerd out walking around the Ames Research Center in Mountain View. I got to go back to the to the to my cast me members and just they were all jealous that I was the one who got to do that. Um, it's really exciting for us to know that the work that we're doing is m perhaps in some ways helping to contribute to the work you're doing. And I want you very much to know that the work you're doing is absolutely contributing to the work that we're doing. You know, the, the, the condition of our planet is, of course, in peril in many ways from a biological standpoint as well as from a political, humanistic standpoint. And Star Trek was created by Gene Roddenberry as, back in the 60s as uh, holding up a, a notion of what the future could possibly be. And that is the source of our inspiration, the, of all of us who are involved in this telling of that story. We believe that it's holding up a paragon, a, a possibility of where, what the future could be, where the surface differences between us as human beings and other alien species make no difference in terms of our ability to connect with one another, our ability to learn from one another, to teach one another, and are no barrier whatsoever to our ability to achieve anything. And of course, we know that we're still bumping up against all sorts of notions and prejudices in, in our current reality, but I do believe that the work you're engaged in of, of reaching out into the unknown, reaching out into the to the wilds and mysteries of the universe, are absolutely helping. Could could and will and do help us to imagine the the greater uh, reality that we're all engaged in, which is that we are this tiny piece of this much larger whole, and that is an enormous source of inspiration and meaning to all of us. Uh, I, I this was this talk was billed as a discussion with, and I'm. Uh, very interested in having a discussion and opening it up to to questions. I don't know if scientists tend to be shy. <laughs> you know, maybe if I were, you know, if you want to have arguments about, you know, certain details of the work you're doing, I can't really engage with that as much on a on a on a micro level. But uh, I'm really interested to engage with you on any level, answer any kind of question or have a, have a discussion. Uh, I'm gonna have questions of my own of like the kind of work that you do, but um, I would, you know, the, the, the time that I'm here and available to you, I, w I was really hopeful that it could be as much as anything else, so a conversation. Um, there are microphones in the aisles. I know that there's um, one there, one there, one there, and maybe and one there. Um, but again, it does require people to be willing to not be shy, or at least be shy and do it anyway, um, which is one of the things, you know, that is, I see someone up there. Hello, thank you. Yes. Hi. 
My name is Ravi. I know many of my friends are looking at me right now. So, and you what? I'm sorry. What did you say? My name is Ravi, and I think many of my friends are looking at me right now because they know that I'm a super Star Trek fan. Okay, cool. Um, where are you so, from? You mind, I would love to know where you're from too, if you don't mind. Uh, so I, I'm a scientist at, uh, at NASA Goddard, and I'm actually originally from India. Cool. So I want to just thank you for coming here, and it really means a lot because I've been interested in Star Trek since I was six years old, and grew up with you know the original Star Trek. Um, I never connected between you know why I was interested in astronomy and 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 Star Trek, but recently in the last six or seven years, when I went to a Star Trek convention, uh, that's when I realized you know maybe that had a great influence on my career. Mm. I met William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy. Um, so what I wanted to tell you is that when you go back and you know do your work on Star Trek Discovery. Please tell the writers and the production people and everyone that um, it means a lot to me that uh, there's a great show, and I get inspiration from the show. Thank so you thank so you. Much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Anthony. Again, thank you for coming out. Um, I'm Wes. I'm from Northern Illinois University, not too far from where you grew up. Yeah, where, where is that? Are you located? DeKalb. DeKalb, right. Yes. In the middle of nowhere. Um, <laughs> it's so, sort of central Illinois. It's weird. It's called Northern, but it's eh, central. It's anyway. Yeah. Uh, so uh, part of, I think, why a lot of us like Star Trek is because it presents normal scientists. And I dare say that you're your character is pretty normal, right? And uh, in Hollywood, I think a lot of representation of scientists is crazy old white dudes, right? That's interesting. And, <laughs> and so uh, a lot, I love this conference. Well, Samus is a little cranky, frankly, but you know. <laughs> but, yeah. I think most of the people you would talk, here, uh, talk to here would probably say that this is one of their favorite conferences to go to. And part of the reason is it's a very diverse audience. It's a very welcoming audience and a, a bunch of just normal people, for the most part. Some of you are, some of you are pretty weird. <laughs> Um, but um, do you think there's any, uh, you know, change in Hollywood or any resistance to presenting those types of scientists rather than the, you know, the Big Bang Theory sort of eccentric scientists? Yeah, I mean, I think that there was, there's been a concerted effort with Star Trek in general, but especially with our iteration of it, um, that Michael Burnham is, uh, uh, what is it, the, the, I want to say, say it correctly, she's a biologist herself, or an anthro, a xenoanthropologist, rather. Um, you know, she's a, a black woman who was raised um, on Vulcan, so there's a, you know, it's an exploration of culture clash there and cultural truths and cultural differences. Uh, then there's Tilly, who's a scientist, um, who, you know, there's people who are theorizing, is she maybe on the spectrum? That's never been stated uh, equivocally by the, by the writing staff, but, and it may or may not be true, but she certainly deals with anxiety. Um, and then there's Stamets, who's, you know, like the cranky queer one. Um, so yeah, I think that there was a concerted effort to have this diversity of representation of really profoundly intelligent, people who are able to come together and that those differences of of skin color of gender of sexual preference sexual identity have n no bearing on the work that they do together it never comes up it's never an issue never a question never anything what's always that question is are they getting to the right solution are they talking about the issues in a meaningful way and I think that that's absolutely um, mindfully done by the writers, and it's something that we as a cast really deeply embrace. Um, and yes, of course, I think it's absolutely true that for far too long, these kinds of stories have been dominated in the telling of them by the traditionally, you know, middle-aged white guy who's often kind of a little bit off his rocker, you know, and. I'm sure that they're, you know, certainly they're, I mean, in some ways, you know, it's probably because Einstein, I don't know if he was off his rocker, but he certainly, you know, had the wild hair and he had, you know, he was, a, you know, he had the German accent. So that, that, that became a kind of icon of what a scientist looked like. And so that became understand, you could say it's understandable that that became the way that it was most often represented. But 
I think it's so clear looking at this room, of course, and, and I'm sure other rooms that are filled with scientists, that is the, the people actually on the ground doing the work are all kinds of people from all over the place. And that it is, it is so important for anybody in the, in the field of show business who are telling these stories and putting these images and putting these characters on screen that they represent the world and all of the people in the world and for far too long it's been dominated only by white men <laughs> just like so many other fields you know the stories the stories you know the 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 spoils belong to the victors and all that kind of thing you know so i'm i'm very proud and honored that i am a part of something that's advancing that conversation in such a meaningful way and thank you for recognizing it appreciate thanks a lot it. thank you hello Hey, so I'm Marta from Portugal, working in Germany, and I actually am an astromycologist. <laughs> Did, were you aware of the work of Paul Stamets? Uh, no, actually. So I, I'm studying fungi in space, more specifically fungal spores. <laughs> so I'm very happy that you actually brought astromycology into the world, because it's super easy for me to explain and to sell my work right now. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have one question for you. How is it to travel on the mycelium network? Um, it, well, <laughs> it, when I did the however many jumps that was, was it 100 and, I can't remember the exact number. 100 how many? 133. <laughs> that was agonizing. That was a really hard day. I had a headache at the end of that day. I mean, seriously, because I was like, screaming for hours you know the, what, you may or may not know this but when you see any in a finished product of a film or television show and you see you know 30 seconds of screen time might have taken many hours to film different angles different setups and everything like that so in that particular day when i was in that chair screaming and sweating and spraying water on me and glycerin and all that stuff it was that was really hard so that that wasn't always so it was pleasant hard. Okay. you know i'm sorry it was hard though then it's not fun. Yeah, but in that case, but, but I, I would imagine, like, I, what I loved about some of the writing, especially when, when um, that idea was first being introduced of, of my character being the one to, to navigate, is that it's, it was an experience of really seeing and being inside of the inner workings of something that was just theoretical. And I don't know about all of you in this room, but I imagine that you, you, you know, when you've had a breakthrough of some kind, when you've touched, when you've gotten really close, you've been working at an idea, working at a notion, and then you actually really see it come to life, that must be so incredibly powerful for you. And so I feel like that it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a metaphorical or imagined way of making that real, but I think it was a beautiful way of making it real. You know, and the idea, I'm, I'm sure you know as a mycologist, I was just reading an article, I don't know, a couple weeks ago about how there's all this studying being done about how trees communicate with each other through the mycelial network that goes on under the forest floor. So it's, it's, it's an idea, it's a science fiction idea that's rooted and based in real science, and that was the germ, no pun intended, that, 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 <laughs> that gave rise to that gave rise to the, uh, the idea of having this mycelial network being something that can connect the universe, you know. So it's, yes, it's, it's, you know, it's theoretical, it's out there, it's, you know, some people could argue that it's silly even, but it's, it is based on something that is real work being done in the real world. And that's something that I think our writers are especially striving to do and proud of doing that they're, you know, Paul Stamets met with the writing staff yeah. early on in the process and got to talk to them about all sorts of things that he's working on and so I hope that we continue to see the exploration of the great work that he's doing um, and, and how it gets filtered into the, the work that my, my character gets to do. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank <laughs> thank you. you. Hello over there. Yeah. Hi. Oh, here. Sorry. Where am I looking? Over there. Oh, over there. Sorry. Hi. 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 I'm Ryan. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Mississippi. Uh, so I wanted to add one thing to what you said about similarities between your job as an actor and what we do as scientists. 
And one of the things that AGU does really well and one of the things that astrobiology does really well is public outreach of science, specifically uh, giving talks about science. And so what you're doing on stage, I actually uh, used to do theater when I was in college, and I find that the skills that I learned when I was on stage have really translated amazingly well into my career as a scientist. And so I'd love to hear any of your comments about, uh, your thoughts about performance when it comes to describing science as one who wasn't originally in science or uh, what we as scientists can do to better, I mean, I have my own opinions about what we <laughs> as scientists can do to be better communicators and to give better talks, but I'd love to hear it from a professional on the outside. That's interesting. Thank you. Um, I think one of the things that was really a key for me in approaching the playing of this role is tapping, and it would be true of any role that I play, is what I call the heartbeat, the soul of the character. I try to get inside of the, of, you know, the passions, the drives, the, the meaning of this character's life, and how I interpret, how I interpreted based on the writing that I was given, but also you know engaging with some of Paul Stamets' work, is that there's an incredible passion for the work itself. So that that fire that's lit by the work is is a key for me, um, and that it's it's about trying to get at the beauty and mystery of the universe. And that's something that I don't have, I, Anthony, don't have to have sat through, you know, years of, of astromycology training to be able to understand what that might be. So then when I'm given a script that has detailed lingo jargon, I can easily look up stuff that helps me just have a, a little more of a grounding in what that might re refer to in a literal sense. But all of it is encased in and couched in the passionate need and drive for understanding and making a difference and making the universe a better place. So I feel like possibly when scientists are doing their presentations, um, and if public speaking or presentation is a part of the work that you do, uh, that of course the data is important and the information is important, but if it can, if you can, you know, do whatever work you can do to also connect it up to the meaning behind it. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean the literal meaning, but the sort of greater global philosophical, whatever you would want to call it, meaning that, that gives rise to the desire to do it in the first place. So that that is communicated as well as all the ones and zeros of it. Absolutely, that sounds great. And one of the things that I often tell people is that when we're uh, talking about science, we're telling stories, and we tell stories in order to invite people in to be a part of a community. And so it's not just the community of scientists, but it's also the community, the Brotherhood of Man, and I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Because, I mean, what do we do as human beings? We sit around and we either tell stories or we watch other people on television engaging in stories, and then we talk about it with our friends later. Yeah. And so the sense of community that we get through storytelling, I think, is, is super important. So thanks for all the stories you tell about science. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Hi, Anthony. Uh, I'm Bill Diamond from the SETI Institute. And like our good friends in, at NASA Ames, um, we're also in Mountain View. So the next time you're up at Ames messing around, come and visit us. I would love to. And maybe give me? one of our SETI talks. That would be a lot of fun. Thank you. Um, I, I grew up with the original Star Trek series. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, like many, you know, found that both inspiring and fun. Uh, I will say that, interestingly enough, the whole idea of intelligent and complex and interesting life forms on other planets really didn't surprise me at all. I mean, it was like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's completely reasonable. Warp drive, I still struggle with. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't there theoretical work that's really being done to say that you can maybe fold space? Isn't yeah, there? folding people... folding space may be something, you know, flying speed or at, the, at a speed greater than the speed of light, I, I doubt. But yeah, folding space time could be interesting. All right. Anyway, the, uh, the problem I have with the Star Trek now being at the SETI Institute is from a SETI point of view, it's game over. <laughs> it's like, you've already found extraterrestrial intelligence. So I'm asking you if there's a place in a future Star Trek episode for what I would call Smetty. I just made that up. It's the search for more extraterrestrial intelligence. Like, so, you know, we've got some interesting planets. We visited some interesting places. Now we've got some Smetty people on board sure. the spacecraft because we're going to look for yet more interesting extraterrestrials. So just something to think about as you develop future programming. Think about, yeah. think I mean, about Smetty because... 
we hate to be left yeah. out. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I mean, uh, what I can tell you is that in, the, in season three, we haven't started shooting yet. I've only seen the first two scripts, um, so I really don't know what's all going to happen in, in the next season. But um, you know, sorry if it's a spoiler for people who haven't watched so far. But we are season three picks up. It's something like 900 or 1,000 years in the future, farther, lo farther in the future than has ever been told in the Star Trek universe before. So I'm personally hopeful and th think it will happen that we will encounter new life forms and, and, and other kinds of extraterrestrial intelligence um, just because the, it's a new sandbox that our writers and designers and technicians get to play in and I'm deeply curious to see what they're going to come up with. So I think there will be Smeti in, in, in our future. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Yes. Hi. We can let him. What? Oh, oh. Okay. oh. whoever. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm Stuart from uh, Caltech. Um, I grew up on a diet of Star Trek, so it's always um, been an uh, inspiration in my life. So thanks for continuing to uh, make uh, great programs. Um, I wanted to just. Uh, describe how I think the astrobiology in Star Trek can interact. Um, yeah. So the day-to-day -day practice of a lot of science can often be kind of methodical and mechanical. You're just sort of following, following a well-established method and, you know, comparing stuff, analyzing. But um, there's also an important role for imagination in science. And things like pure maths, this is, this is sort of, and uh, theoretical physics, this is it's sort of obviously essential. In astrobiology, it's also essential, but kind of for different reasons, because we have no idea what we're really looking for out there. Yeah. And so um, I think sometimes in science, we underestimate the value of artists and how much we can learn from artists and creative people. And so I think when, when we engage with something like Star Trek, it, it reminds us of what it's like to to, to have your sort of creative hat on and have a, a really open mind and let your imagination uh, run wild. And um, yeah, so I think, you know, the more, the more crazy the stories are, the better. And well, thank um, you, yeah. <laughs> it's actually, thank you for saying that. I was, it was something that had crossed my mind too when I was thinking about, you know, what our intersections might be. And I wondered at whether scientists ever do consider themselves creative in that way, or artistic in that, in that I, way. I think they should, yeah. Yeah. Um, I can promise you, you know, in, in my field, there are technical things that, even as an actor, there are technical things and specific things. And I mean, I need to learn my lines. I need to understand what the camera does. And that, you know, it's certainly very helpful if I have that technical knowledge. But then there is that other sort of ineffable thing that happens when it's, you know, when the, when the sort of the, the magic of it is happening. But I would imagine it's not that dissimilar from from the scientific world, right? It's got to, there's got to be some crossover. So. Yeah, like this week in the evening after we've had a few drinks, that's normally, sure, yeah. that's normally when magic happens. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to, I'd like to so point much. out yeah. thank you. Thank you. that we still depend a lot on the Horta from the first iteration of Star Trek. Uh, and as a silicon-based life form, it was pretty interesting. This question, however, is completely unrelated to that. I'm from the North Shore, and we have our Uncle Bucks and our uh, Home Alones. Uh, but what do you think about the fact that the best portrayal of Joliet was in the Blues Brothers? I know. Can you I fix know. that? I know. It's it's because there's a big prison there. I mean, it's just you know most people know Joliet because of the Blues Brothers if they know it at all. Yes. Yeah. But right. I'm from Joliet. Lionel Richie's from Joliet. Yeah. John Barrowman. If there's any Doctor Who fans who played you know Torchwood, he's from. We went to high school together. You know, so there's like more than a prison, and there's more than the Blues Brothers. From so we'll we'll look forward to you squaring the circle later on in life. Squaring? Do you say squaring the circle? Yeah. How, what does that mean again? When you square the circle? <laughs> Portray Joliet as the completely well-rounded place that oh, yeah. it is. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Hello. Hello. Um, my name is Lauren. I work at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. So I, I come at uh, astrobiology from an ocean world's perspective and uh, studying our oceans to look at oceans on other worlds. Um, we were talking about stories earlier and I wanted to tell a story, a short story. Um, so I was raised by my dad and my grandparents um, and my grandfather died when I was 13 
Um, he didn't finish eighth grade. He wasn't very educated, but he was this mechanical genius. He could figure out how to fix just about anything, and he was fascinated by engines. And I found out years after he died that he loved Star Trek, the original series, and that he would sit my dad down and he would say, we're going to watch Star Trek. <laughs> he called it Trek? He called yeah. it Star Trek, yeah, yeah, um, of course. And they would sit down together and watch this show, and, and he was just obsessed with rockets and space travel. And uh, he never got to see me become the first PhD in the family or go into astrobiology research, but uh, I think it's amazing that that legacy exists in our family that began with this show. And so when you go back, um, you know, tell the people that you work with that, uh, <laughs> that this show has had a, an impact not only on scientists, but on the families of scientists and people who uh, maybe didn't get to pursue those dreams, but still saw them on this screen. Thank you so much. That's very, very moving, very, very meaningful. Thank you very, very also, much. Also, it's just so cool to stand here and talk to you because I've loved Rent since high school. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I promised I wouldn't sing at you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I love Rent too, believe me. It changed my life in, in every possible way. It's also that long, circuitous, weird path that took me to being a part of Star Trek. Absolutely, Rent is a huge part of that too. So you just, you know, you never know how it's all going to wind up. Um, I was, I, I, when I was in the media presentation, I saw this incredible, I, there, there's moments that I was like so blown away by that I, that, that I didn't even know this, that it showed Earth and in scale six um, moons around Earth that collectively have, if you put them all together, their oceans would, I can't remember the proportion, but would out ocean the ocean on Earth. That blew my mind. Um, so it seems it seems perfectly reasonable and meaningful that that uh, oceanographer would also be working in astrobiology and um, I just hope you know I hope that selfishly I hope that I'm alive when we find these weird creatures whatever they might be these microbes or or squids or whatever they are so uh, thank you for continuing to do that work are there more hello yes uh. Hello, I'm Sylvia Nupp. I'm an undergraduate at the University of Arkansas. Um, when I was little, I watched the original Star Trek series. Which I know I'm a little young for that, but that was that was my start. Um, and Me my, too. <laughs> my original, or my favorite episode was definitely the one about uh, the silicon-based life form. And I really hope that the Horda. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I really hope like in the future for Star Trek that you'll continue to push the boundaries of what could be life, even if it seems a little crazy at the time. That's always my favorite. Yeah, I'm, I mean, again, I, be I believe that that's true. Part of it, you know, it's funny, and with the Horda, you may or may, if I'm, if I'm spoiling things, I'm sorry, but the, it, it, there was a, a props guy that had like a, a rag raggedy rug that he kind of like put some styrofoam or thing blobby things on and then he kind of was in it and made it move around and that became the horda you know what i mean so i don't know which came first if they thought like we're going to make this creature that's so unlike any other creature you've seen on earth or if he just like put that together and said hey what do you think of this you know <laughs> but um but yeah i mean that was like such a low budget thing i don't even know in this day and age when we have all these special visual effects if they would even think like that but I do believe that there's a desire to have, to expand the notion of what life could look like. I mean, uh, and if, again, if this is a spoiler for those who haven't seen all of the episodes, I apologize, but um, in, in season two, there is a, a, spore, a spore species that has intelligence that interacts with Tilly that then manifests, you know, it, 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 you know, it gets into her nervous system and then it, and it manifests as a human so that she can interact with it, but it's, it's really a spore-based life form. So we, there has been some attempt to do it. Um, and I think that I would like, to, I imagine that they're gonna continue to try to find these, these, these ways, these, mm -hmm. these incredibly weird and imaginative creatures. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Megan Elwood Madden. I'm from the University of Oklahoma. Um, I wanna try to meld 
rent with Star Trek here. And my husband just sent me this quote, how do you document real life when real life's getting more like fiction every day? Yeah, that's, I, a, that's a lyric, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I, I'm curious, speaking about like the, the life forms, we can push the boundaries there, but I think many of us were inspired by tricorders and remote sensing techniques that in many cases we can actually do in the field now. Like we can take out an XRF and shoot at a rock and tell what's in it. Or we can use a Raman remotely to look for signs of life. So how can Star Trek and other science fiction keep pushing the boundary of technology to help us as scientists really envision all the fabulous things we could do? Thank you, I mean, I think that that's a great a great question. I mean, one of the—I don't know if this is inspiring to you guys or not, but it, you know, we in our in our version of Star Trek, we have all these hol hologram displays, but they're interactive, and I would imagine it's sort of like VR, but it's you know, unlike in VR where you're cut off from your fellows while you're in the virtual landscape, you can be inside of whatever thing you're working on and turn to your colleague, and you can know you're both looking at the same thing at the same time. I, I don't know if that technology is is meaningful or, or worthwhile to you guys who are actually doing this kind of on the field work, but it's certainly cool for us. Yeah, so we can actually look at large data sets now with VR, like that we can walk through a data set, whether it's a spatial data set or whether it's a more like a quantitative data set. And that's really helpful to like immerse yourself in your data. Is Even that something if it, you can do with with other people, though, in yes. real time? Okay. Yes, you can put on the VR headset and walk around and spin your data and look at it from different perspectives or look at it with different variables. Yeah, it's really cool. cool. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that Trek is certainly engaged in exploring, and I think a lot of science fiction writers continue to, you know, there's all this stuff around machine learning and AI, and I don't know all the implications that's going to have on the work you guys are doing, but... That's something that is always interesting to the to the right, you know, Android technology and cyborg technology, and you know, I don't know if that applies at all to to what to stuff that you're doing. But I I, I guarantee you that like we have an amazing props master who is always dreaming up things and and presenting them to the production team and. And uh, again, I you know we're we're engaged in a in we're going to go into production in a few weeks, and so I'll be going on set and seeing I think new th brand new things that they've come up with, given that we're going to be in interacting with uh, a galaxy that's 900 years in the future. They're, I'm sure they're thinking of all kinds of new technologies that we haven't seen before. Um, I don't yeah I I think I can say this once it's uh, you know if it's spoilery I, I don't think CBS will sue me. Um, <laughs> There, one of the things that they talk about in the in the first script I read is that this technology of of uh, I don't know what you, what it would be called, but there's a substance that you could program, and then it would make something in real time. So like, say I need to have a chair right over there. You go boop boop boop, and then it like molds itself into a chair. You know, in almost not instantaneously, but it forms itself into that, and then it could you could reprogram it. It could mold itself into something else. I don't know, you know, some sort of like nanotechnology kind of thing like that. That's something that they're that they're playing with, and I don't know if that's inspiring to anything that you guys are doing. Yeah, cool. Over here. Yes. Over here. Oh, sorry. Hi. Hey, I am a Tony Bruni from uh, Georgia Tech, and I don't know how um, connected you are to the people in the writing end of things that are doing this stuff to comment on this, but I uh, I noticed a little bit of a funny difference between the way that uh, your series is interacting with um, certain bits of science than uh, older series is have. Like in the older series is you would have like big uh, concepts of science or science fiction. You'd have like, oh, here you have the Dyson sphere, here you have the genetic message from the past, all kinds of stuff. In season one of your series, I there was a moment I burst out laughing because I recognized the paper that Burnham was quoting, oh, and yeah. <laughs> and uh, that that seems like a different kind of engagement. And I uh, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on the people involved in doing that. Yeah, I think that I I believe that the the writers are working really hard. They're very interested in trying to ground concepts that we're engaged with in at least some theoretical or offshoot of 
real theoretical science, if not actual science and theoretical science that's being done on the ground in our day and age, and then trying to extrapolate what that might look like. So I think they do take that seriously. You know, I, this may or may not be, um, what's the word, uh, uh, like just an anecdote, but apparently like when they were doing Next Gen or Voyager or one of those old series, the writers sometimes would literally say, we're just gonna make a word salad. We're just gonna give them like a bunch of gobbledygook to say we don't care because it just sounds technical. But I do believe our writers don't do that. They try to have the, when, you're, when we're talking about tachyons, they're trying to make sure that it really does apply to what tachyons could or would be. So I haven't, even though I have had a lot of, you know, mumbo jumbo to say sometimes, it, when I start to do the research and it, it, it is grounded in something. So yeah, it, I'm not surprised that there was an actual paper that they're quoting, for sure. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me at all. You know, there are a bunch of nerds in there, <laughs> I promise you, you know. And then there's one writer in particular who's like a deep Star Trek nerd, like she knows everything about all the series, so she's like the one that they can always turn to and say, does this fit with what came before, and if it doesn't, how can we make it, you know. I guess they're squaring the circle. They'll squ <laughs> how can we square the circle of that? Uh -huh. yeah. cool. cool, thank you. Oh, uh, I've been told that this will be our last question. Sorry, no warning, but hello, hi. Well, perfect timing. Um, I'm Diana Gentry from NASA Ames Research Center. Like many of the people who have uh, spoke, um, my dad showed me the original Star Trek on reruns when I was a kid. And I can say that I would not have gone into science or engineering had it not been for that experience. It's amazing. Um, but one thing that has always stood out to me that is unique about Star Trek is that it takes care to portray scientists and engineers not just as plot devices, but as people who have friends and families and hopes and dreams and relationships that matter. And I think that that is incredibly valuable, not only to making sure that the field stays open to people who are creative and think outside the box, but also to the way that we as a society think about what science and engineering can do for us. And so I just wanted to say thank you for portraying a character that makes that real to people. Thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. So we've a little bit overstayed our time, which is great. Oh, I'm sorry. And no, no, this is fabulous, and we're, we have a reception uh, afterwards. But uh, Anthony, thanks so much for, uh, for your fabulous presentation and for all you're doing for astrobiology and astromycology. So Thank can you. everybody join Thank me? Thank you so much. Thank you. But, um, but wait, that's not all. So Anthony, before we let you go, we have a quick surprise for you. So I'd like to invite Mary Wojtek back oh. on the stage. Oh my God. Oh my God. Wow. So many of you may or may not know Aaron Gronstall. He's the artist that originated the Astrobiology graphic novels. Um, there's gonna be a signing on Thursday Wednesday, whoops, on Thursday, because I'm taking the rest, no, uh, on Wednesday, um, issue seven on prebiotic chemistry is coming out. Um, he also is responsible for our logo. Uh, and uh, in honor of you spending time with us, Anthony, um, we've, well, he wow. <laughs> has made a, wow. uh, so many people in the community are excited to find themselves in our graphic histories. You're not in here, but you're on the on this so painting. So, <laughs> so for people who can't see this, Thank you. riding a tardigrade. He's riding a tardigrade. It's like the best fan art ever. And, yeah. and we'll, we'll, we'll ship it for you. Oh, great. Oh, right. cool. Thank do we need so to much. do anything awesome. else? Yeah. I get to release you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for you. joining us. That's and <laughs> yes, <laughs> Anthony's going to be around maybe for yeah. a, a little bit. Yeah. And enjoy the reception. Thank, Thank you. you.